Today we dive into a realization I had that led me to what I believe is the key concept to painting both white and black. What up, mini family? Let's take a stroll down memory lane to what sparked this rabbit trail. I had just recently finished painting the vampire model that I'm currently selling, the Duchess. Buy yours on miniac.co. And I was super proud of the entire model, but especially the dead flesh that I had accomplished. So I went to go show my wife, and the first thing she says is, why'd you make the skin purple? I was confused. Now obviously I used purple in the skin tone, but my intention wasn't for the face to look purple. It was for it to look off-white with the purple shadow. But then I think I figured it out. Chalkboard time! Let's get nerdy. Imagine that these squares are any part of a miniature you're painting. A singular ab, a cheek, the other kind of cheek. Imagine applying layers of paint to it, not worrying about blending at all. An assumption you may have that seems pretty reasonable is that every single layer will get equally smaller like this. You can see all the layers below the top one equally. Okay, so far this seems pretty straight up. Somewhere in here is your shadows, somewhere up here is your highlights, and then smack dab in the middle is your midtone. Your midtone is special. It's the color you want the object you're painting to end up looking like. But if our midtone is white, how do we highlight it? Nothing gets brighter than white. And if our midtone is black, how do we shade it? Nothing gets darker than black. Well, the first understanding about white and black that you need to have is that nothing in the real world is actually pure white or pure black. But everyone knows that. My epiphany came when I realized that the layer shouldn't be getting equally smaller. If I want my square here to read as white, I need to shrink the size of my non-white layers that my near white and pure white layers are largest. Similar for black, I need to shrink the layers that are to non-black so that the black and very near black are the biggest layers. I don't know if there's a term for this, but what we'll call it in this video is value distribution, or how bright and how dark your colors are and how you've distributed them across your miniature. Okay, we're just just about getting too nerdy and this is starting to make sense so let's head back to the bench. If what you're painting isn't reading as white or reading as black and that is your end goal, consider messing with the value distribution to include more near whites or near blacks. Let's test this theory on a miniature and see how it might be carried out. A lot of hand waving going on here. Now we're gonna get especially nerdy in this episode. I'm gonna talk at you for a long time so occasionally you may need to slap yourself so you don't fall asleep. Oh. To make this more bearable, I'll break it up into sections. Let's talk about the technique of layering. One thing I like to say is that white can be shaded with any color and black can be highlighted with any color as long as there's enough white or black hanging around on your miniature for whatever you're painting to read as white or black. But how much white and black is enough? It's hard to know, so let's just paint until we find it. For this miniature's skin tone, I want it to read as white, but a warm white. I'm going to start with a red oxide color as my maximum shadow. I'll then mix in white paint and start to layer the color on. I'm not worried about blending at this stage. I just want to get the right color in the right spot. A great question at this point is, well, how am I supposed to know what the right spot is? Well, I have a video all about how to highlight your miniatures that you can watch, but the basic premise is this. Imagine rays of light coming down from your light source, which in my case is a light source directly from above the miniature. Wherever the light rays and the surface of your miniature form a 90 degree angle, that is, they are perpendicular, that's where your highlight is brightest. Anything farther away from 90 gets darker. Now, there is a lot more to this, so if you want to hear more about it, make sure to watch that video. With my first layer, I'm covering up 97% of the dark red oxide tone, so I'm being really aggressive. It might have made more sense to start with this color and then shade with red oxide. But let's just play this out. It's really important to think about your future layers. You need to create enough space for yourself. What I mean by that is that my next layer will need to exist inside the one that I'm painting right now and the next one inside of that and so on and so forth getting smaller and smaller. I better make this starting layer sufficiently large to account for all of my future layers, or else everything else will get too small too fast. While I'm slinging paint, let's talk about today's sponsor, and that's Hand of Glory. 
Hand of Glory is a miniature company that's changing the way that we use our models. The core design element of their model is that each mini is engineered with holes in their wrists for the installation of magnets. Then, a corresponding weapon or item which is magnetized with a metal slug can be snapped into place. The system is really simple and easy to install and this allows for endless hot swapping, which is really fun to do. Did your D&D character level up and get a new weapon? Swap it in. Did you slay some monster and acquire his weapon? Take it. The use cases are as endless as the options that Hand of Glory has for accessories. On their Kickstarter, you'll find everything from halflings and dragonborns to the four-armed Goliath we're painting in this video. As for weapons and accessories, there are over 100 options currently on their Kickstarter, ranging from standard weapons and maces to heads on pikes and dogs on leashes, what? There are so many options for so many scenarios. This also isn't the first Kickstarter the Hand of Glory has run. Their previous line of miniatures and weapons is fully compatible with this one, allowing for even more options. The whole collection now has dozens of figures and over 200 weapons and items to play with. The current Kickstarter will be live until March 31st, and you can find it linked in the description below. Thanks for sponsoring this episode, Hand of Glory. Now back to the nerdy paint chat. Let's talk about dealing with everyone's favorite complaint about white, chalkiness. Another reason why I like layering for white specifically is because white is often difficult to apply without getting a chalky effect. It's my theory that this chalky effect comes from not getting full opacity over previous layers. You can get this chalky effect with any color that's light because they don't cover well over anything that's darker than them, which is most tones. With layering, we can slowly increase our brightness layer after layer, and ensuring that each layer gets full opacity, which will result in no chalkiness. Oftentimes, this is much easier said than done. You still need to have good brush skills and sufficiently thin your paint, and each layer you apply, even though you go gradually, will likely not be full opacity in one coat, which means you need to apply a few coats of the same color on the same layer, try not to make it too big or too small, and it, ugh, Suffice to say that the coverage of white and the idea of value distribution make it hard to deal with. But with a little bit of patience, anything is possible. Okay, but does the concept of value distribution have further implications? Definitely a question you had, right? <laughs> yeah, so what are the, uh, the further implications of value distribution, yes? This idea that we're discussing can be realized with any kind of painting. Whether it's blending with an airbrush, or wet blending, or glazing on top of a white undercoat. With an airbrush, you often go back and forth with your highlight, shadow, and midtone, trying to get the right amount of each so that everything is looking right. It's just easiest to think about value distribution and to see it when we're talking about layering, which is why I'm choosing that route. This is where we stand at the end of the layering stage. There are some problematic areas that could use some fixing. There are some obvious transitions in my layers and you can see all the tones present on the model, just some are in very low quantity. The next step that I would take is to soften some of these transitions with glazing or feathering or wet blending. In an effort to keep this video less heady than it already is, we'll keep descriptions of those techniques out. I have separate videos about those techniques if you want to check them out. Also, while I'm smoothing things over, I'll adjust various layers. Maybe I'll make a dark red shadow smaller or a highlight bigger. I'm looking at the miniature and I'm making spot adjustments based on what I think is wrong. And this part is a little hard to quantify for you. It's something you learn with patience. You'll likely have no problem finding things that look wrong, but you may struggle with how to fix them. Try to adjust the value distribution or the shape of the highlights and shadows and see where that gets you. What's left is to paint the rest of the miniature. A lot of white is surrounded by red because I applied it with an airbrush, so possibly removing some of that will help with what the skin tone is perceived as. If it isn't surrounded by a sea of oxide red, maybe it'll read a little less like red. I painted the straps and pants as black to demonstrate further the idea of value distribution. With black, I'm trying to make sure a lot of black and near black sticks around so it still reads as black. So here's the final thing. Do you guys think I was successful in my goal to paint the skin as white and the pants as black? I gotta say, the white was way more fussy than the black, but it might have been how I approached starting with a super dark color. 
The equivalent in black work might have been starting with a super light undercoat and applying more and more shades to it until we hit black, which saying out loud is making me cringe already. But the real determining factor of my success doesn't lie with you, the viewers. It lies with the ultimate judge. What color do you think this mini skin tone is? Pink? Thanks for watching my video guys and hanging out with me and letting me just talk about a nerdy thing that I've kind of been sussing out over the last couple of weeks. I really appreciate it. If you guys like the channel and you want to support it, there are a number of ways that you can do that. Namely a Patreon campaign with a bunch of fun rewards, like a Discord server where you and I can hang out any day of the week and chat about your favorite kind of puzzles to put together. Alternatively, you can purchase hobby gear that I recommend in the description of this video. Any purchase gives me kickback at no extra cost to you. Or you can buy the miniature that I'm producing and the digital course for it, the Duchess, a vampire model that's 75 millimeter in scale. And don't forget about today's sponsor, Hand of Glory. All our stuff linked in the description below. Subscribe today! And most importantly, don't forget to...